Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. Super pumped to join us today to have Josh Yen. We're going to be responding to a video from Matt the Elephant Hunty where he claims it's the end of the cosmological argument or the Kalam cosmological argument. So what's up, Josh? I'm doing good. I mean, it is a very, very big claim. I think Kalam cosmological arguments have always been one of those things where the theists love using it and then the atheists love like just like talking <laughs> trash about it. So it's something which is very interesting and I'm really looking forward to go over this video with you. Yeah, I'm super pumped, and Josh and I both have a lot of respect to Matt, and we're attacking the ideas here, not the person, of course. And yeah, the Kalam's always super interesting. It's not my favorite argument, but I definitely think you can defend it pretty well, um, and it's definitely not the end of it. So yeah, do you have anything else you want to say, Josh, before we dive into the clips? I definitely agree with you. I think that the Kalam is is a very interesting argument. It's deceptively simple, let's say, and let's put it at that. And I think that it's also a very useful tool, not just to argue for God, but I think it could be used to argue for a lot of other things as well, like the need for metaphysics first cause, which might not even be related to God at all. So, I mean, I think it is a very interesting kind of stepping stone to use when you're starting off a discussion with any theist, atheist or whatever. So I think it's quite an interesting thing or place yeah. to start off with. Right on. It's super cool. All right, we're going to dive into these clips. I bumped up the speed to one and a half speed just for the sake of our time. And obviously you can go and check the link down below if you just want to watch the full video of what Matt has to say. But here we go. If you take a look at the Kalam, there's a number of terms in there that I would argue are not so clearly defined that they avoid equivocation. For example, what does begins to exist mean? Within our local presentation of the universe, it could be argued that nothing begins to exist, that everything within the universe is merely matter and energy transposing, taking different forms and shapes. That while at some point it's true, Matt Delahunty did not exist, everything that makes me me has existed prior to me. Um, and that the only real things that like could exist that didn't exist is in fusion in a star where you, you take atoms and, and essentially fuse them together to make new elements. And yet still that was from the constituent parts. And so everything could be reducible to the singularity, et cetera. So what does it mean to say that something begins to exist? All right. So what do you want to say here, Josh, with this first part on beginning to exist? Well, I think that this is perhaps a deceptively, um, perhaps a big problem, because, because what we see here is that you either stick directly with the Kalam syllogism as what we like to view with William Lane Craig, or do we refer to the Kalam as kind of like the entire Islamic tradition arguing for a first cause? And I think if we're looking at the second part, and that's kind of how I think is a more charitable, or at least the better way to view the Kalam, to just say, well, any argument which is arguing towards a first cause can be labeled as under a Kalam cosmological group of arguments, then I think that it doesn't really matter what do you mean, whether it begins to exist or whether it's a changing state of affair or you're viewing the entire situation as a state of affair instead of just every individual blocks or individual objects, a lot of different things. There's a lot of different ways you can formulate it. And just that there isn't one wholehearted kind of idea about uh, what it means to begin to exist, or at least in Max's case, he seems to raise a lot of different possibilities. You can just say, well, yes, maybe that the Kalam doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. It just means that maybe if you want to take a certain a view about the beginning to exist or the beginning to exist idea, then you can have a Kalam cosmological argument formulation for that and doesn't necessarily defeat the Kalam cosmological argument. Mm. I think that's helpful knowing there's different kinds of PSRs that can adapt to different kinds of situations. But I just want to say, like, here, my point is just that, like, Matt kind of explains himself, in my opinion, what, like, begins to exist means. Because he talks about how maybe you want to say, like, the matter energy that makes a methyl honey previously existed. But obviously, when he formed, or the moment of, like, whatever you want to say, like, personhood be is... Like something new comes out and it's Matt Dill Honey. Like Matt's not going to say, I've just existed from eternity past and my atoms are just continuously get rearranged. Um, so there's definitely something different here. And I think we can tell when something begins to exist and it's something, it's something intuitively obvious because we can just, like Matt describes it himself. Like we kind of just know this. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with you. And I think that perhaps to deny this sense of beginning to exist is what William Lane Craig once used to call it. I think it was something like muriological nihilism, the idea mm -hmm. that there is only kind of parts instead of there is only kind of materials or atoms in the universe without any parts actually existing. And as a result, under that view, quite an extreme view, then you would say that no such things begin to exist. Perhaps you'll say that, oh, the the, the idea of personhood, identity, or even objecthood is is just purely um, imposition that we add into the world instead of there actually being an object there. So instead of my maybe my jug of water and my cup being two different things, they don't they actually aren't they actually aren't things. They're just atoms, and there's actually no difference, like literally between the two, at least in the 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 realm of muriology. So so perhaps that could be one of the extreme views, which is illustrated by Matt. Though I don't think that that is at least practical, or at least intuitive as you have said yeah that's good i it's in his discussion with cosmic skeptic uh william lynn craig where he talks about that because it's like 
if nothing begins to exist, then Matthew Honey uh, or doesn't actually exist. If he did, if he, nothing begins to exist, unless you want to say that Matthew Honey is just like always existed in the same for like me and you and everyone else, which has like serious like potential moral consequences. So, yeah, that's my take. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree with you on that. But also, there's a difficulty in assessing that category if we're looking at the universe and saying the universe began to exist. Is that true? Our local presentation of the universe um, does apparently have a beginning, but does that mean that it, there wasn't the matter or energy prior to that? Does it mean it was produced in a multiversic sense? Did, what did it always exist? And this expansion uh, is the latest in a series, or did it always exist? And this expansion is the one and only. Um, but to say the universe began to exist is at least dubious. We colloquially would say, of course, the universe began to exist at some point. There wasn't this universe, and at some point there was, in the same way that at some point there was not a mat, and now there is. So, of course, a mat began to exist. Um, but when we're talking about things and making arguments, in this sense, we have to be a lot more specific, because we open ourselves up to equivocating between, oh, well, when I say the universe exists, what I mean is that this particular pattern of the universe began to exist. And now we're not talking about the substance, but about the structure. Uh, and that's a little different. But in premise one, everything that begins to exist... Okay, what do you think here, Josh? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that perhaps just at the end bit, he talks about the structure bit, and perhaps that's kind of like the substance versus structure. Maybe kind of he's flirting with the idea of perhaps a myriological nihilist view about the universe. So that might be something that he is uh, tending towards just to kind of pick on the last few words there. But it does seem to suggest, and I think um, you would agree with me perhaps here, is that um, that ultimately when we're talking about the universe beginning to exist, we're talking about kind of the idea that the substance in the universe did indeed begin to exist for example the physical properties the atoms are not here uh forever they 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 are past finite whether you view them as a changing um different set of events or a different states of affairs or even if you take the extreme meteorological nihilist view and say there's only substance and no structure to it or or there is only atoms and there's actually no parts or something along those lines you would still just say well even if that's the case the universe still began to exist and there's good philosophical and scientific reasons which you could find either in the works of william lane craig or wherever about this and we can elaborate that on a bit later if you want to hmm. that's super helpful i do think when we're thinking about this i have some sympathy with mac because sometimes it can be hard to like what do we mean by universe but i mean i think at least like when you're using this argument for god people will say like all of space time and i was looking in the black book companion to kind of see like what craig thought about the kalam and like what beginning to exist means and he talks about like philosophical arguments like you have things like hilbert's hotel or the grim reaper paradox they just showed there just cannot be an infinite temporal regress of events so it's the idea there must be a first event and from that first event they'll argue that it's god and then like the science like the bgb theorem and like thermodynamics and such is why like some theists are going to try to advance more to show that there's like an absolute beginning point of the physical universe that can show like through the sciences. So I think it's a helpful distinction here. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with you. I think that's very helpful. And I think it just shows that across the board, no matter what perspective you're looking at it, you realize that there actually are very good reasons for us to believe that universe ex just does indeed begin to exist. Mm, yeah, that's great as a cause for its existence. What a curious phrasing to say begins to exist. Do you have some example of something that doesn't begin to exist? And in what context do we mean begin to exist? Are we saying this particular pattern representation? Or are we saying these actual material components? Because there's not an atom in my body that just popped into existence uh, on, on me. Um, there are things I've taken in, breathing and eating, etc., that are adopted and you know, complex chemicals. This is the process here. So what do we mean by begins to exist? And why was that word there? Well, I, or those words, I would say that the biggest reason those words are there is that earlier versions or earlier potential versions of this argument would say everything has a cause for its existence. And when, the, when they finally get around to concluding that God exists, now all of a sudden that means that God has a cause for its existence. But for some models of God, God is not a caused thing, that God is the uncaused cause, the first mover, the prime mover, the first cause. And so if you're going to argue for that, then you have to put in this particular language. Everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. But let's Okay, what do you want to say here, Josh, in this little bit? Mm -hmm. Essentially, what I kind of think is that it appears to me, as we've noted before, there's a few ways to kind of define or categorize Kalam cosmological argument, and perhaps giving Matt the most charitable kind of explanation or understanding possible would be to kind of say that maybe he is only referring to Craig's formulation, and instead of viewing it as kind of how I view it, is in the, the entire group of kind of Islamic tradition arguing for the first cause, and perhaps that's why he's kind of nitpicking so strongly the idea, the wording of beginning to exist under his conception of it. And perhaps that's why he is very specific on this. But personally, I don't think it really matters whether you change this like wording of it or have different formulations 
or perhaps a different strengths because I was uh, thinking about something recently and I'm like, well, a lot of times, yes, the Kalam cosmological argument is presented as kind of a, mo a mainly deductive argument, one based on kind of like the logic, it's 100% like kind of you lead to a conclusion, it's 100% kind of certain in, in that kind of sense. But the same way you could may as well or just as easily have um, a probabilistic when I say, well, it's just more probable that the universe began to exist, it's just more probable that there is a cause and therefore there is most most more probably or it is most probably the case that the universe has a cause and as a result instead of having this kind of more of 100 certainty you have a more of a probabilistic understanding of it and just say well yeah it is a really a really reasonable belief even if you're not going to grant it say well maybe it, instead of being 100 percent certain that the universe began to exist like 80 percent certain or 70 percent certain so like there's a lot of different ways you could go around doing it as long as you're saying well let's classify kalam arguments as things which are not just the william lane craig traditional formulation and I think it's just a bit help, more helpful, or at least to develop dialogue and discussion to kind of take the second kind of discussion or view viewing of the Kalam cosmological argument. I think that's helpful. And I think like Matt would agree, like there isn't like one the cosmological argument or the teleological argument. Like I've heard that him say that a lot, which is like really mm -hmm. good. And I think it'd be the same with the Kalam where there's different ones with different PSRs and different ideas of what it means for the universe to begin to exist. And there are family of arguments and we're just looking at um, just different ideas with like a similar core here. So I think that's helpful. And it might just kind of speculates a little bit with like why Kalam formulations have changed. But like even going back to like Al-Ghazali, there's people that would have a very similar argument to Craig. So it's not like there's been this massive historical shift in the past like thousand years. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with you on that. But let's set all that aside because one key element of a syllogism is that it has major terms, minor terms, and middle terms. The major terms have to do with the subject and the minor terms is what you're trying to establish about the subject and the middle term is what connects them socrates is a man all men are mortal therefore socrates is moral the man the men thing is the middle term that connects socrates and mortal when you have this structure you have the universe and existence or cause for its existence and what you have as the middle term is begins to exist and so you have everything that begins to exist as a cause the universe began to exist therefore the universe has cause it's it's an undeniably valid syllogism so why am I saying the Kalam is dead? What's the end of the Kalam? Well, it should have been dead from the beginning as an argument for the existence of God. Because what is also undeniable about the Kalam is that it never mentions God. Not the word and not the concept, though some people would like to weasel that concept in. The conclusion of the Kalam, Kalam is that the universe must have had a cause for its existence. Now, I'm not necessarily convinced of the soundness of the early premises, but let's grant that. Let's just say that, yep, if something begins to exist, it has a cause, and the universe began to exist, therefore the universe had a cause. What do we know about the cause of the universe? Assuming that the cause exists, what do we know about it? I don't know. I don't have any way to investigate it. Oh, well, we can definitely know that the universe isn't the cause of itself. Well, I'm not convinced that we can definitely know that um, because causality is necessarily temporal and temporal causality breaks down at t equals zero, which would be the origin of the universe. But also we're sloppy with language because if the universe, if everything that is in our local presentation of the universe existed as essentially a singularity and it expanded, then what you're talking about is not the cause of the universe, but the cause of the expansion of the universe. And I don't know what would or could cause that. And I don't know if anybody else does either. And yet they will argue on behalf of a god. Okay, so a lot of things here, Josh. Where do you want to take this? Well, I think the first thing is just really to say, I'm sorry, I have something in my mouth because my throat's been absolutely dead recently. It's absolutely killing me, so I had to keep. Uh, I had to just eat a lozenge to kind of like yeah. soothe my throat a bit. I apologize for that, but essentially, I think that what Matt is perhaps trying to do is to just kind of say the clam is not dead in its sense to reach the conclusion, but rather the conclusion just doesn't reach God. I think it perhaps is quite right when he says that, and I don't think it's much of a problem, but just that what he's doing is identifying the first stage of the Kalam cosmological argument and the second stage of the Kalam cosmological argument. The idea that the universe has to have a cause and that the fact that the cause is God, there's two stages here, and that's something that I think Zach knows a bit more about than I do. So Zach, do you want to continue about that? Yeah, I mean, typically when you're looking at people like Craig and such, when they're making the Kalam, they're not just saying the universe begins to exist, um, so it has a cause, and then we're done. Like, that's not how, like, that's not how it, Craig argues. That's not how most people argue. People then try to identify, like, this cause of the universe is God, arguing things like the cause maybe might be, like, need to be, like, timeless or initially, like, changeless or something like that. So there's two stages of the argument, and most theists, I'm pretty sure, will go from saying there's a cause of the universe to trying to defend that it's God. Because, you know, if you start without the Kalam or you start with the Kalam, you have a lot more, like, weight towards the theistic hypothesis, I think. And then you can try to identify that, like, it's God, the cause of the universe. So I think that's really helpful to understand, like, the two different stages. Like, the Kalam is just the first stage. 
And then from the second stage, you're trying to identify it as God. And there's things like if you use like a scientific argument and you get like space time beginning to exist, we're getting closer to God. Like you're running out of options of um, what could be like the cause of the universe if space time begins to exist because it can't be like space time. Um, so that's what all I want to say is like it's broken into two different stages. And the first stage with like the first three parts of the column, like that's just to argue that the universe begins to exist. There must be like a first cause. And from there, we're going to try to connect that first cause with God. I definitely agree. And I think that that kind of distinction is very, very helpful because I think what Matt might be doing is just to kind of skipping past or like kind of overseeing this latter stage, which I think is so important, a part of apologetics. And and it would be, I, I would agree with Matt, if someone came out and said, well, we got to this cause of the universe and well, now we've suddenly proved the Christian God, which is one of his criticisms that he raised in nature. But well, that's normally not what people do. And as a result, when we have to look at the clam cosmological arguments, we have to look at it from a purely or like the holistic kind of approach that apologists normally use alongside the clam. It's not just one kind of one screw fits all. It's like you have to really look at it in a more holistic manner. Yeah, I think that's right. It's just a But even if you were able to list the characteristics of the cause of the expansion of the universe or the cause of the local presentation of the universe or however you want to word it, even if those even if those characteristics were similar to the proposed characteristics of an unproven God, that still doesn't make them identical. Oh, well, it had to be something timeless because time didn't exist before the Big Bang. And, okay, well, it doesn't even make sense to talk about before the Big Bang and, and maybe that cosmology is not correct, but it has to be timeless. Okay. Um, but really in that context, all it means is that it's not bound by the time within the local presentation of the universe. It doesn't mean that it's not bound by any time. It doesn't mean it's not bound by meta time and the metaverse or anything like that. It just means that X is not bound by the time constraints of the local presentation of the universe. But that's obvious and true for anything that would be this change since time began, our local presentation of time began then. Well, it's spaceless. Yeah, you can do exactly the same thing with it. it's not made up of the stuff of this particular universe if it was something external to it that caused it and not something internal to it that we haven't identified yet. Okay, what do you think here about the spaceless and timeless ideas and trying to get hypotheses without God? Do you want to start off with it? Because you seem to have quite a lot of interesting stuff. We can go <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's a few things here when I think about. So it seems like Matt's just trying to grasp at any other hypothesis, like anything that's not God that can explain like the cause of the universe, assuming like the universe began to exist, which is fine because I'm not a big fan of like conclusive proof that like demonstrate beyond any reasonable doubt that like God exists. So that's why I think like comparing theories and looking at like what's expected on one theory and on the other is like a more favorable approach to trying to like look at the question of like does God exist? So like if Matt's going to do like the matter and energy proposal, well, I'd say, okay, Matt, let's just look at like how like the theistic theory does compared to like the matter and energy theory. Like is it predict things like fine tuning or like consciousness or things like that? And then I also think that when we're looking at this question, it seems like to me, Matt starts out with like this idea that there's a super low pr probability of God existing. And it seems like he does this a lot in his debates on like the resurrection or things like this, because it seems like to Matt, any explanation other than God, that's a better explanation, which is the prior probability of God is like super, super, super low. Well, then that's probably the right approach. But then the, that's the question at hand is like, is the prior probability of theism like super low, which is a different debate. So I think that's something like when I look at it, Matt, because it seems like when he's looking at this, he's like, it's impossible for God to exist or very unlikely. So like any other explanation must be better. So that's just a few of the thoughts I had at this clip. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what you're discussing about that idea of prior probability is very interesting because normally when you look at a hypothesis, you normally start off with uh, like, at least if it's a more experiential one, you'll say, well, if I like, did, is is this person going to eat breakfast tomorrow? Unless you fully know at least further things about that person or not, you're going to say, well, it's probably around 50-50 to just kind of give it like a balance. And then with further evidence, you take it a bit further to one side or the other. And I think it's quite important to use this kind of, kind of like this state of, I, I want to say state of like, like not no, no knowledge, but rather like this like lack of understanding about anything else to say, well, perhaps if we don't know any other further kind of parts, we could say, well, it's just 50, 50. And as a result, when you just say, well, let's treat the prior probability as very low, that's perhaps not doing very the, the argument or the idea of much justice. And I think one thing else that you can perhaps add from this is that the idea of time, the sure meta time that he raises in the first place may, may as well be correct. It, it's not all about, well, everything that is in time has to have a cause. That's not necessarily what uh, the Kalam argument says. It's very possible that there is time before, um, the beginning of the universe, perhaps if you take an Augustinian view of the world, like the time is just kind of like a, a, a perspective or like um, a third person. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how we would explain it, but it's kind of like God is here. God has like his own kind of structure of time and then time moves of subjective or in relation to the time of God. So in that situation, you may, you may as well have the beginning of the universe in relationship to the time of God and there is time bef before that. So there are a lot of further things that we can explore here. And 
and we can uh, discuss, but it doesn't necessarily seem that what he raises here as his objections actually defeat the idea that God cannot be the explanation or God is not the best explanation. And furthermore, I think that there is also good uh, mathematical arguments, or at least philosophical arguments, that any physical kind of entity or any physical being has to be um, temporally finite. And as a result, if you approach it from that perspective, it doesn't match whether you have five million universes before this. If they're all physical, then that means they must have a beginning as well. So I don't necessarily think that pushing it back just one universe actually helps the argument a lot. Mm. That's super helpful. I think like just comparing worldviews is a really good kind of way of thinking about this as well. So I just want to emphasize that. And you can check out um, Graham Lappy and Kenny Pierce's debate book. It's a really good book on like that, this exact question of like, how should we like argue about like, God's existence and things and they get into like cosmological arguments and such. So that's helpful here if you want to go further in this dialect. But let's get into this next section where he's going to talk about the Kalam not mentioning God. You can keep going through those, but eventually you get to, and it's a mind. Hang on. How did we determine that it's a mind? There's nothing in the Kalam that tells us it's a being, that it's an entity, that's nothing in the Kalam that tells us it's even necessarily timeless, spaceless, um, nothing. And yet they're using the Kalam to reach that. Because if they can make it sound like, and, and I've heard them say almost word for word, therefore the universe had a cause for existence, and that cause must be timeless, spaceless, blah, 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 and that sounds an awful lot like God. And that sounds nothing at all like a valid and sound syllogism. That sounds like propaganda. You've used a, a seemingly obvious and yet still questionable syllogism to determine the universe must have a cause and then you go and put on a smile and say that cause must be god because it sounds a lot like god well why is that cause not a multiverse why is it not a physical process that's beyond our current ken why is it a mind and why is it in particular a mind that's absent of physical form with power over everything which provides no clear evidence of its existence and yet somehow inspires people to different conclusions about reality it's got to be the most confused and confusing agent thing ever the kalam cosmological argument is not an argument for the existence of god that's an undeniable fact that is not an argument for the existence of God. It shouldn't even be classified as an argument for the existence of God. At most, it is an argument for the universe must have some causal explanation. It's an argument that if the universe began or changed or something like that, where an action must have been taken to change it, then there must have been that action. It's almost a tautology in, in its structure, but it's not in its substance. And then after spending so much time on presenting this very short, very simple argument, and then arguing about the premises, which they still haven't been able to establish. They skip past all the middle bits and just assert that the God is their clear cause. Even if the Kalam cosmological were sound, it's not an argument for the existence of God and the apologists have all of their work still in front of them. You could say, I believe the universe had a cause and I don't know what it is. How is it that you think you've known what it is? And why is it that you think it's the supernatural author or inspiration for your particular holy book and you seem, seem to think you know what he knows or cares about people's sex lives or morality or anything? There's a whole lot that's being glommed onto. The universe must have had a cause. When we're not even sure about that, we should continue to consider the arguments for the existence of God that are presented. But we should also demand that if you're going to present an argument for the existence of God, that it needs to be both valid and it needs to be valid in structure before we can ever even consider it. And the premises must include God, either as the actual label for the concept or present as a concept itself, clear concept, not one where you can say, ah, there must be some explanation for this. And that explanation is God, because God can, God's a panacea. God can serve as an explanation for anything. If you create a fictional being that can do anything, what couldn't it possibly be the explanation for? God is the reason there's Toji. Okay, what do you think here on this idea that it's just like the Kalam doesn't mention God? It's, it's kind of similar to what the last session we responded to. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> on his point that um, it sounds a lot like Christian propaganda, I think what he said just now sounds a lot like atheist propaganda, because I do think mm. I've heard this a lot of times um, by um, atheists, and I think it's just... As we've said previously, just skipping past the idea that there is indeed a second stage of the Kalam cosmological argument, which he's either ignoring here or he just is kind of um, kind of just kind of pushing under the covers right now. And it also seems quite weird. I mean, if you do indeed grant that there is a space this time, this metaphysical a co personal cause of the universe, it'd be quite weird to say that and just say you're an atheist. Like, I'm not sure, like maybe you could be an atheist and identify as an atheist while believing in such a cause of the universe. But personally, and under my view of the world or my worldview, I would say that person is as much a theist as you would find one. Like, I, I wouldn't be able to think of a better example of a theist than someone who says, well, oh, I'm an atheist or, no, or like, oh, I believe in a, in a universe which has a metaphysical timeless, spaceless cause. Maybe it's not a Christian theist. I, I grant that. But at least it does seem to move a bit closer to the theist side than the atheist side. Mm. 
that's super helpful and i just want to emphasize again like remember the arguments broken down into two stages like the first stage is arguing that like maybe like the universe began to exist so there's a necessary being and then from there like we go from a necessary being to it being god and i don't know who matt has in mind when he's talking about like the person that um doesn't defend like the cause of the universe to be god he just kind of asserts it but, like that's obviously the wrong way of doing things like the theists still have more work ahead of them like you have to show like um why god's the most plausible candidate and if you read someone like Craig in the Blackwell, like he tries to go through like why the cause of the universe must be God. So like there is literature there trying to argue this. So that's all I would say here because it's a little bit redundant with the last section. Mm -hmm. Completely agree with you. Alrighty, here we go. We have one more section left. Toe jam. Ta-da. We didn't know anything. We hadn't bothered to study it. We don't know what it is, but toe jam needs an explanation. And boom, until science comes up with a better one, God's it. We should absolutely consider the arguments for the existence of God. And we should consider the evidence presented. And yes, that includes presenting and uh, considering anecdotal evidence. It's just that anecdotal evidence is not sufficient to justify the acceptance of the supernatural and the extraordinary. But this argument is neither an argument for the existence of God, nor is it evidence for the existence of God. It is a mirage. It is a distraction. It is an attempt to make apologists look like they are being reasonable and look like they are making a case when they're not. It's like painting a tunnel entrance on a cliff wall like Wiley e. Coyote, then taking a picture of it presenting that picture to someone and saying, if you were standing in front of this, and if it were a real tunnel, you'd be able to go through it. And because of that, I'm not only confident that this represents a real tunnel, but that it was built by the Army Corps of Engineers. And now that we know that it was built by the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers would like to talk to you about where to invest your money. The long cosmological argument is deader than a dead thing when it comes to demonstrating that God exists. But it's very, very, very much alive in convincing apologists and people who already believe that they're on really firm footing because it just seems so intuitive. Of course, the universe must have had an explanation. Something can't come from nothing. You hear these things all the time and they're asserted and they're accepted. And yet there's no demonstration that they're actually correct and that they necessarily lead to a God. So I'm pretty much done with the Glom Cosmological argument. Now, if somebody calls into the show and presents it, I'll give some shortened version of this as I've been doing a little bit. But there were people who were confused as to how can you dismiss something that's so prevalent? I mean, William Lane Craig of all people, this is like his favorite argument. Yes, it is. Because then it looks like he's accomplished something when he's accomplished absolutely nothing. See you next time. Bye-bye. All righty, here we go. That's the end of the video. So Josh, you have any like last thoughts you want to say looking at this last section? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that a lot of the things which we're going to say are just going to repeat what we've done before. I mean, a lot of what he said is just merely skimming over the second part of any cosmological arguments or any second stage arguments for the existence of God. So I think that that part is perhaps a bit, um would be a bit repetitive if we went to say that again. But I just think, Personally, I think that he strawmans a lot of um, what the Kalam cosmological argument is, or at least the literature surrounding it. It's kind of like, oh, it achieves nothing. I, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think it achieves a lot. And, and perhaps Matt isn't as, um, and this is definitely not a personal attack against Matt. That's definitely not the case. But it seems that whenever I say stuff like this, people kind of interpret it as it's, but whatever. Like, I, I don't really mind too much about that. But essentially, I think that uh, the unfortunate thing is that I think Matt's perhaps overlooking or just like, what he's doing is just thinking, well, okay, I have a certain view of the cosmological argument, or I, I have like a certain view, and well, anything which falls out of the expectations that I set for the argument, then that's just a completely destroyed, ruined argument. That's not necessarily the case. Like, the cosmological argument, or any, in fact, any argument um, in the world is is used in a very in a varieties of different ways, and and when we judge these strengths of the arguments, it's very important for us to think, well, what exactly is this argument arguing for? Who is the person raising the argument, and who is the person who raises the argument's intention. What is that intention and where exactly are they trying to get? Because there's a, a quote that I like from Albert Einstein. It's like, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, you'll you'll always think it's an idiot. Like if you judge a um, cosmological argument by its um, ability to prove like every single minute detail in the Bible, you're never going to reach that standard, even though the argument never intended or was made to even reach that standard in the first place. So I think it's very important when we approach any arguments in the Kalam cosmological argument in specific in for uh, this case, of course, we just have to think, well, what actually is the Kalam cosmological argument trying to do? Is that matching up with the expectations I have for this argument? Because if the answer is no, then you realize that, well, I've just been judging this argument in a completely wrong standard. And maybe when I say the argument is ended or when the argument is dead, well, that's just completely pointless because the argument never intended to do that in the first place. I think that's super helpful, Josh, like thinking about like, what is this argument trying to show? And if you're looking at like the first, like the first part of the argument, like that Matt talks about a lot, it just ends with like trying to show that like, the universe has to have a beginning, which is like a conclusion. But then like, that's not the end of the story. Like if you read people or listen to people that like argue for the Kalam, typically, I'm sure there's people out there that stop there, but most people aren't just stopping with the universe beginning to exist and it must have a cause. Um, so 
that's all I would say here. I mean, I also wonder like what would Matt consider evidence because it, it's always tricky to me. Like when um, some people talk online, I'm just like, what do they mean by evidence? I'd be curious if Matt ever responds or he's probably not going to respond, but if you ever listen to this, I'd be curious, like just shoot, shoot me an email or something. Um, I'd be really curious what your definition of evidence is. And it's not out of like smite or something. I really do value his opinion. And I'm just curious. So yeah, that's really all I have to say here. We've talked about most of the things and reviewed things. So yeah, Josh, do you have any like last thoughts before we wrap up? No, I think that this might have, this might set the record as the fastest response video that we've ever done together. And, and it's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, I can't believe it's only 30 minutes and we've responded to really like 15 minutes of content on one and a half speed. So, but I mean, I think a lot of the things like we've just like had to emphasize again and again, so we don't have to have a lot because he doesn't really challenge the premises here. It's more of just like, um, how do you get from like there being like a cause to it being God and just like the intentions and like motives behind the argument. So, yeah. All right. That's everything from my side. Yeah. yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you everyone who joined us today. Super grateful for you and your opinions. Um, I hope you've found this valuable and we use this as a search for truth. It's not some sort of like inclusive, like debunking or proof or anything like that. We're just trying to seek truth and give our take on things. So yeah, thank you so much everyone for tuning in. Hope you have a good one and God bless. We'll see you next time. Thank you.